Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. And today's the day. We have part one of Brian Michael Bendis' Man of Steel released, as well as the final issue of Scott Snyder, James Tenyon and Co.'s No Justice. So I wanted to take a look at both of those titles first. And let's go ahead and cover Man of Steel first, because that is the pressing issue and question and fear perhaps that everybody's been looking to it's important to realize first of all as the first issue there's not a lot you can say about the big picture yet because anything we say good or bad at this point could completely change and switch over once it's fully developed with the rest of the story we don't really know how everything's going to go i would say that there's not a lot of new information thus far the problems that I had with the general story arc, the way he had revealed it, are still there. But I am at least happy the way he's characterized all of the players thus far. So th that's in general. Let me be more specific. And I'll avoid spoilers here, should you want to check it out on your own. But the issue jumps back and forth between the past with Rogel Czar, the character we were introduced to in Action Comics 1000. And this is the past when he was trying to bring about the ruin of Krypton. So it jumps back and forth between that time and then the present. And the present takes place after the short story that was in DC Nation. Because Mrs. Good is present in one of the panels. She's already working there at the planet. So we know this takes place after that. So I'm not quite sure what that was supposed to mean then in the DC Nation story when she's having dinner with somebody and says, I'll own the Daily Planet by the end of the day. I don't know what that means. I don't know if she's a plant for... Luther or something else, but is this the very next day or what's going on? How much later is this? What's going on with her? What was going on with that little tease? I'm not quite sure. That'll need to be explained. It'll be an unfortunate hole in the story if that's just ignored and then they take it on a different timeline at this point. So that's the general setup in the setting where we are, how this issue is rolling forth. I'll start with the good. The characterization of Superman and Lois for a brief moment we see her is quite good. To this point, anyhow, he has not altered the character of Superman. This is pure Superman as we know and love him to be in the iconic fashion. He stops some villains at one point. I won't say too much about that or who they are, what's going on. Not everything's been revealed, but again, avoiding, spo avoiding spoilers. And he has a right amount of banter with them, which is perfect for Superman. He's not going to tease them like a Spider-Man would, and he doesn't. And he doesn't threaten them like a Batman would. But just the right amount of banter to show how confident he is in a great characterization there. He also saves some people from a building fire and even puts out the fire in a unique way. All of this is classic Superman and the way he comports himself through the whole ordeal is just perfect. Towards the end of the issue, he has a brief flashback of what I'm guessing here is a time before whatever's happened to Lois and John happens to them. It seems like the issue ends right on a cliffhanger of right about to let you know what's going on there, but it, you'll have to wait for issue two, of course. And that's not really a spoiler, because no one expected that to be all explained in the very first issue of the run. But for a brief moment, we have just a couple of lines from Lois, and I'm just sticking with the good here before I get into the negative. I appreciated the little bit of spunk we saw from Lois, in typical Lois Lane form. I've loved, loved, loved the Dan Jurgens action comics, and the Tomasi and Gleason Superman run. They've just been golden in every way. If I had to say one thing about them, though, now and then, I felt like Lois might get lost in the fray a little bit. They were focused on John and Clark, as they should be, but sometimes Lois would be limited to playing the wife and the mother. And it's great, and it was wonderful to see her develop into that, and to see her really embody that role with Clark and John. So I'm not complaining about that whatsoever but if i would have peppered in anything in that run it would have been a little more of the feisty spunky classic lois lane self in there in the context of wife and mother and just in the free few brief lines she has in this issue one of man of steel we see that come through so i appreciated that the other thing i should mention and i really should have mentioned this first is that the art in the issue is just glorious love every bit of the art even the atrocious, what I think is atrocious anyway, character design for Rogal Czar is made a lot more palatable by Ivan Reese's pencils and Joe Prado's inks. For the second half of the book, we have Jay Faybook on the art, and it's just glorious. It's beautiful to look at, every, every panel, every image. So that's a real treat. 
the problems I have are, are unchanged thus far, as I said from the reveals and the teases about this run. The idea of Rogel Czar and this new development in what happened to Krypton and how everything Superman thought he knew about his past is going to be turned on its head, that is just a horrible idea. It's been done a million times. It's not even remotely original. And I can't stand the way Bendis keeps talking about it like it's just a revolutionary idea. And I forget if he says that Didio thought it up or, or he thought it up or asked Didio about it or whatever. They just keep acting like this is the most amazing original idea ever. It's been done a thousand times in one form or another. And it actually speaks to a bit of laziness and a void of ideas if all you can think of to challenge Superman is chipping away at his most foundational truth about himself or whatever. That's just a little melodramatic. It's been done probably in better ways than this run's going to flesh it out. So I'm disappointed in that angle that it's taking. I hope that it plays out in an interesting way that's not horrible writing. We'll see. Like I said, we really don't have all of the details in on that yet. The other issue I wanted to bring up with this part one here might seem like kind of a nitpick if it was anybody but Bendis doing the writing. Because of Bendis' track record and because of the things he said about this run and, and uh oh, the marriage of Clark and Lois, you should be concerned about that and so forth. There's a scene in which he meets a woman who's the new deputy fire chief. And she has a moment where she's meeting Superman and she is clearly flirting with him. Clearly flirting with him. He's pretty solid, as we'd expect Superman to be, as a married man, of course. He's not returning the flirtations by any means, but he's he's polite, professional, and welcoming to the city and so forth. But she's clearly enamored with him and has this little moment, which may come to nothing. Might just be a little character moment of how anybody would be completely flustered upon meeting Superman for the first time and so forth. But it could also play very easily like something out of a romantic comedy or something like that. And that has me a little concerned and worried knowing from Bendis' own words how this is apparently nothing sacred and something that he can mess with, the marriage and, and whatnot. No matter what he said later, he, like I said, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth with the marketing of this. So that's that's something to watch. I'm going to be a little concerned. Hopefully it'll come to nothing, but it's something to watch. Unfortunately, I have to worry about those little things because of the way he's set this whole story up. The last thing I'll say about it isn't really a positive or a negative, it's more of a curiosity, is the whole idea of whatever's happened to John and Lois to have to make them go away. The thing is, this little stunt, whether it came from Bendis or Didio, has put an end to the wonderful Super Sons run, and it's put an end to the glorious story arcs we've had from Jurgens and Tomasi. So to be worth all of that, it better be something absolutely amazing, and I can't even imagine how it could be such a thing. The only things I can imagine are among the least catastrophic. <laughs> so hopefully that will play out better rather than worse. For the first issue, like I said, you can't really say much more than that. We don't know how these things are going to develop. We only have four more issues, I think. It's a five-issue run. So these things will have to develop kind of quickly, and it's going to be a weekly, and I certainly will cover each issue as we get to it. But I just wanted to give the brief report for those who are waiting and those who are concerned as I was about Bendis and the way he's represented this run and all of his ideas and so forth in a very unprofessional way that's not necessarily befitting of a Superman writer. But at the same time, I wanted to recognize what's quite good about the issue. And I'm happy to report that the characterization of Superman is spot on thus far. I will let you know if that changes, but hopefully that stays the course. That's the Man of Steel run. If you've read it, let me know what you think in the comments. And moving on now, let's talk about the culmination of the No Justice run. A link to my review of issue one, I was a little nervous about this one. But issue one hooked me in, and I was interested, I was a little concerned, I was wondering where things were going to go. But I was definitely sucked in, and it has been a great ride. I don't have almost anything critical to say about this run, it was a lot of fun. I could also distinctly see... Both Scott Snyder and James Tynion's influence in the story. I'm not as familiar with Joshua Williams as a writer to pick out his influence, but I could definitely see Snyder's and Tynion's. I'm impressed that after four issues and so many characters involved, not only the characters 
involved in these four Justice League teams, but also the peripheral characters all came in in this last issue and had their moments too. That was really great. It did what a good comic book event should do, what Infinity Wars did in the film and even in the comics, is really bring in all of these heavy-hitting characters and giving each one of them their moments. And the story arc, in this sense, when you have a lot of characters, you can either pick one or two characters to be basically the main focus and then give everybody else sort of a little moment. That's what something like Captain America Civil War did. But this is an event that brings in all of these characters and really takes everybody on their own character developing arcs, short as they are, but everyone gets a moment and you can map everyone's progression. And that's that's great. The pacing was great too, and I was worried about that because it starts out so cosmic and in medias race, which means starting right in the middle of the action. That's great. It hooked me, but I thought, where are we going to go from here? Because Scott Snyder's work sometimes just gets too cosmic and too out there and too, oh my gosh, I don't even care what's going on anymore because I don't understand it. You know, <laughs> But that wasn't the case here, I'm happy to say. And I think Tinian had a big hand in that. I, I liked this combo of Scott Snyder and James Tinian. I hope we see more of that in the future. I'm very much excited about the Justice League title now. I was extremely dubious about that Justice League. I didn't know how that was going to work out at all, but I'm really excited about it now. I'm, I'm anxious to give it a go. I love that we have... The Outsiders and Dark Justice being formed here at the end of this issue. And I'm not giving spoilers, I'm just saying some of the, the great things about it. I love that Waller has her smug face shut in at one point, because <laughs> I can't stand Waller. She's a great character to have in the story, she's good for tension, but I hate how there's this contingent of fandom and even writers who just want to have Waller be like the new Batman, and she, she's prepared for everything, and she rules the universe, and this and that, and I'm glad she got hers. I was a little worried about that. It ends on a positive note. That's That was really wonderful, especially after Dark Knight's Metal. I was just preparing myself for some more darkness and some more grim, blah 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 But it really was great. It ended on a positive, hopeful note. We still have this crack in the source wall that's going to cause problems, but a good, decisive victory that was wonderful. I even liked the villains and heroes working together. I usually don't like that at all. I think it usually comes off as spectacle just for sales, but they actually handled this very well, and I liked the way... It lended itself to the story and the character development, so that was great. I was very much interested in the designation of the teams. So we've got this idea that these are four laws of the universe, mystery, wonder, wisdom, and entropy. And each of the four Justice League teams were divided up according to the characters who played into that force. Now that definitely hooked me in because I'm very much interested in archetypes and designations and so forth and, and looking at the resonances of that. And sometimes it was obvious. Sometimes, of course, you would have Lobo and maybe the more reckless Beast Boy on a team like Team Entropy, and you would have Batman there creating order out of the chaos and navigating the chaos, bringing some sort of new life out of the chaos. That was that made perfect sense. Of course, you would have the magic-based characters on Team Wonder. So we have Wonder Woman, we have Zatanna, even Dr. Fate and so forth. That made perfect sense. Team Wisdom was really compiled more of knowledge based characters, not necessarily wisdom. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Not to say that any of these characters don't have wisdom, but what really stands out and binds these characters together was knowledge, technical and scientific knowledge. So you had Cyborg, you had Flash, you had Harley Quinn being a psychologist, and the Atom, and, and all of these characters who were insanely genius about science and technology and so forth. They were Team Wisdom. That's really Team Knowledge. But, you know, as labels go, it works. I was curious, though, about Team Mystery. You had all of the aliens on Team Mystery. So Superman, Starfire, Martian Manhunter, Starro, even, and Sinestro. So we had aliens on Team Mystery, but that just seems alone like a like a weak designation for making them Team Mystery. I mean, sure, they're, they're a mystery to Earth to which they travel to, but they're not a mystery to their own planets, and they may or may not be a mystery to, to Kolu. There's certainly no more alien or no more mystery, quote-unquote, than Brainiac himself. So I was curious as to why they would be Team Mystery. I mean, there's telepathy with Martian Manhunter and Starro, but the rest of the characters don't necessarily play into that. So that one has me a little stumped. I'm at a loss to figure out why they were Team Mystery, and I hope it's not just that weak delineation of them being aliens. I hope there's more, something more to it I'm just not getting. So if you have any ideas about that, please place them in the comments section. I'll continue to think about that and see if I uncover that. So that would be a critique unless I unless I find it out or it's explained to me. But still hardly worth mentioning in the midst of all the fun this run was. I had such a blast following the story 
as high as the stakes were, everything was definitively taken care of, and just a great story. You had all the Green Lantern Corps. You didn't have the entirety of the DC Universe. The rest of the teams that this new Justice League was drawn from were in stasis, so Nightwing, the rest of the Titans, Teen Titans, and so forth. They were in sort of a stasis, waiting this out. And I loved Green Arrow. Green Arrow's role in this story was wonderful, just as the most human, I guess, superhero, at least in the terms of this story. Batman has got his fingers into enough things and knows about everything enough to be sort of on a more cosmic level, even though he's only a human himself. So Green Arrow was a perfect candidate to be the, the Earthling left behind, so to speak. And you had Supergirl and Batgirl doing what they could, but Green Arrow played a, a crucial role back on Earth, and he receives a profound reward for it in the end. I thought that was a really great moment as well. So, so many wonderful moments. I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to bust into too much analysis, because this is more of a review, just to cue people in who might be wondering about this series. You can still read them all on Comixology, of course, and you can probably find issues of them all in, in certain comic shops, certainly still online and whatnot. So I, I definitely recommend No Justice. It was great, and I look forward to seeing what the Justice League line is going to bring us from this point. So those are my reviews. Again, just sort of quick reviews of Man of Steel 1 and No Justice, the entire run here, four-part series. I might return to these and do a more in-depth analysis at some point, but I wanted to give the basic review along the lines of the values and the things that I look for in stories. And if you watch my channel or seen a few of my videos and you know what that standard is, I have some more videos in the pipeline coming up soon, so definitely click that bell for notifications if you haven't yet, and subscribe, of course. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.